February 25th, 2020 marks 40 years uh, exactly since the election of Jim Hacker and the airing of the initial episode of Yes Minister, a, a cult classic uh, uh, for a lot of us. So to celebrate the occasion, we have six very special guests and they're all seated in the front two rows here, uh, all of whom are senior leaders in government, past and present, uh, and they're going to share with us some of their favorite scenes uh, from the Yes Minister and Yes Prime Minister series. Um, they're also going to share uh, and, and reflect and kind of assess the series and, and share with us some lessons and, and really reflect on what has changed since February 25th, 1980, and, and what hasn't changed. Uh, in other words, we're going to try to assess the legacy of the series uh, and measure the gap between the comedy and the reality. We're going to look at whether it's a sitcom or a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, to help us set the scene, uh, I just want to ask a couple questions uh, to you. Um, so, uh, please raise your hand. Who here has never seen a clip or a, an episode of Yes Minister? Just uh, show your hands. Okay, um, see about five or so folks. Uh, no gray hairs. Um, okay, another question. Who here has seen a clip or an episode of Yes Minister? Okay, and now keep your hands raised if you've watched the entire five seasons of Yes Minister. Okay, it's starting to feel like a Trekkie conference for uh, a few of you, doesn't it? A Star Trek convention. So, uh, one final uh, note of logistics. We do want to have some kind of uh, interaction, Q&A. Uh, because we don't have a, a formal kind of panel and then a Q&A session at the end, uh, I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to take questions throughout the event. Uh, we have a, an app which we're taking questions through. Um, all you got to do is open up your phone, go to slido.com, uh, and to enter the event code IPAC, IPAC. Uh, so I'll get your questions uh, right on my tablet, and I'll kind of uh, probably point on you to ask your question and try to uh, match the rhythm of the event. So, um, so that's how we're going to take questions. Um, okay, great. So um, now I'm delighted to introduce our first guest, uh, Graham Steele. So Graham, will you please uh, join me up uh, at the front? Uh, and please welcome uh, Graham Steele. Said it, Sir Humphrey or Steele. So, um, 
So first, I need three volunteers. Um, just put up your hand, uh, or else I will pick you. Uh, so, okay, Luke, I see one hand up. Uh, come on up here, and then two more. Deputy Hudson, I saw a hand. Uh, is that your hand? Laura. Laura, Laura. <laughs> come on up, Laura. And I need uh, one more. One more. And so Luke will just get you to stand up right here. Okay, we, Laura, come on up. Those so are Deputy Minister of Justice, you'll have an advantage. Uh, and one more volunteer. Okay, right there. Yep, hand up, Olivia. Okay, great. And so we'll just get you here uh, lined up. Uh, there are great prizes. So, um, so what Greg's going to do is he's going to read out uh, quotes. Um, we'll start with Olivia. Okay. Uh, he's going to read out a quote. There'll be three rounds. You'll have to guess. Was it Graham Steele that said this, or was it Sir Humphrey? So, okay. um, Graham, how about you kick us off? Okay. Question one, round one. Okay. okay. Yeah. Quote one. First quote. Waste is often in the eye of the beholder. Was that Graham or Sir Humphrey? I'm going to say Sir Humphrey. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, Laura. Okay. Too much civil service work consists of circulating information that isn't relevant about subjects that don't matter to people who aren't interested. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was Sir Humphrey. <laughs> The savings are vague in the future and rarely materialize. They're, they can choose them, right? Uh, let's go with Mr. Steele. Correct. Yes. 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 Correct. Yes. Okay. Perception is reality. Since people vote based on what they believe to be true, it doesn't matter what is actually true. <laughs>
place a copy of Yes Minister, the complete Yes Minister. I actually, I brought, uh, I bought two copies on Amazon. One was a, a used, beat up version my, for myself, and then another one was a clean, nice version. Uh, but I brought the wrong one, so you get the used version <laughs> and uh, uh, scotch, another favorite of Sir Humphrey. So uh, one, a round of applause. Okay, that was fun. Thank you. Um, it is actually amazing it, how many things I wrote in my book that I realized afterwards a very similar version was in the Yes Mainstream book as well. So, Graham, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I did the math, and uh, when Yes Mr. came out, you would have only been a scrawny 16 year old, I think. Before you were all generous. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so when did you first come across the series? Can you kind of just like walk us through your your um, yeah when you first kind of ran into Sir Humphrey? And I am sure that I saw it not long after it came out because what I did my first uh, university degree at the University of Manitoba. Any other grads from Manitoba? No, no grads. Oh, right there. Oh, okay, good. Uh, but I actually uh, studied public administration at the University of Manitoba. So. As soon as the series came out, people were really into it. But of course, at the time, I hadn't worked in government, so it just seemed funny. It just it just seemed funny, and, it, and le much much later. So I, I I've known it probably for as long as it's been out. Um, but I was elected to the legislature in 2001, and I spent eight long years in opposition. And then 2009, my party was elected, and I became a minister. And within very short order, my father-in-law sent me the book. <laughs> he said, you're going to need this. And so I actually, when I became a minister, I went through and reread the whole book, so got reacquainted with the series. And at about the same time, a former MLA named Jeremy Ackerman, which you oldsters will recognize him. He sent me the complete DVD set <laughs> and said, you're going to need this. So not long after becoming finance minister, I rewatched the whole series from beginning to end. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, well, that's quite funny. I remember uh, uh, talking to another kind of sitting deputy minister right now, trying to explain the, the, the background of the event, what we wanted to do. He told me it was a career-limiting move. I have no, no idea what he was talking about. I, I, weirdly, though, I've never seen even a single episode of Yes, Prime Minister. Like, I, it, it went on for, what, a couple of seasons? Two more, so I think three seasons, two. Yes, Minister, and then two seasons. So I'm familiar completely uh, with Yes, Minister, but not at all with Yes, Prime Minister. Okay. Something to look forward to. So you were, you were the Minister of Finance, Kitty Affairs, uh, ERDT. Uh, I was speaking with Simone Dontremont, who's, who's going to be speaking a little bit later. I, I understand he was the Sir Humphrey to your general. Yes, he was. So, so I was, for those youngsters in the room, I was the finance minister for three years. Then I spent a year out of cabinet. And then what I call the best summer job I ever had. I went back in the cabinet for about six months in 2013. And Simone Dontremont was my uh, deputy minister. And we were such a raging success. But not long after I was finished there, they ab abolished the entire department. Isn't <laughs> <laughs> that yeah, right, Simone? Yeah. yeah. But that's right, so Simone is my that's deputy. Right. Yeah. Now, you don't have to say it was Simone or, or another deputy, but have you ever had that moment, you know, where a, a, a deputy minister, you know, in the series that were called permanent secretaries, but has a deputy minister ever kind of leaned into you and kind of whispered in your ear, your ear, why, why minister? What a courageous idea. Has that, has that ever happened to you? No, uh, because uh, I think that the person who was closer to Sir Humphrey was not Simon mm -hmm. Don right here. It was my first deputy minister, who of course I can't possibly name, but it was Vicky Arnish. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was wonderful. Uh, don't get me wrong, I have an enormous amount of respect for her. She's smart and she's tough, and she's she makes Very an, appearance, knowledgeable. Uh, an appearance in your, in your chapter about public accounts, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah she does. Right. So, okay. uh, yeah. yeah <laughs> um, but she was more like the Sir Humphrey Appleby character. If, if How many people here know Vicki Harness? She's been retired for five, six. Yeah, she, she, eight. More than eight. Now that I think 
about it. She retired while I was the minister. It was the only thing she could do to get away from me. <laughs> yeah, so she must have she yeah. must have gone for about seven years. Um, but still is around the public uh, public sector. But she was more like that character. She'd been around government her whole life. She knew government inside out. She'd seen a succession of ministers come and go. I was just another one. I wasn't going to be there that long. We both knew that. I mean, let's face it. And one of the things they say, Matt, in the in the in the book is ministers don't last very long. And interchangeable marketing units. I, I was for I was the finance minister for three years, and at the end of that three years, I was the second most senior finance minister in Canada. Some of my colleagues in other provinces had turned over twice just in that three years, and I was counting on the way here. It's slightly under six and a half years since I last was a minister, and in that time, we're on our fourth finance minister, right? So. Ministers are there for a good time, not for a long time. <laughs> I know that's all. <laughs> okay, so you've got a clip. Uh, I'm saying you brought a clip that you want to share with us about walkabouts. I wonder if you can kind of set that up for us and okay. share the context. This, this is when, when I read the book, I said, that happened to me. And this is about, okay, I'm not sure where you're going to start the clip. But that's okay. But a walkabout is when a minister goes walking around the department. Because, of course, Politicians like to see themselves as as people people, you know what I mean? It's like they, you've just come off an election, you're walking on air because you've just been appointed to cabinet, you feel like the world is your oyster and you are with the people. And that means that the first thing you want to do when you go to the department is go out and meet everybody, which deputies hate, <laughs> deputies hate. So let maybe, Maybe we could watch the clip. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, just imagine uh, this kind of sort of really happened to me. So just watch this and thinking of Sir Humphrey as Vicky Hirsch. Okay. Well, the minister might like to know. Yes, well, I take it that you're from there. Yeah. It's a difficult one. They're friends, you see. They are no friends of good administration. <laughs> well, give me 24 hours. Yeah. I'd have to square the party organization and get the chairman in back of one of those drinky dudes at number 10 or something. <laughs> Soften the blow. Right, do you anything else? No, I think that's it. No, no, no. have 
weird ideas and conspiracy theories and long-standing grievances and all that kind of stuff. And if the minister goes, right? You all have, you all have people like that? You're talking about minister, uh, Department of Finance and Treasury Board. Well, yeah, like within your department, you, you have these, right? And, and if you can't think of who it is in your department, it's probably you. <laughs> anyway, so, so the deputies don't want the minister to get bits and pieces out of context. So deputies see their role as taking everything from the entire department and molding it into context and giving the minister the full range of the facts and the options. And if the minister goes walk about, who knows what's going to happen? So I was discouraged from going walkabout, but I was a man of the people, so I went on a walkabout until that one terrible day. And do you want to walk us through that day? <laughs> oh yes, this is when I learned not to go walkabout without some preparation. And and what happened was, so this wasn't the first time I'd gone walkabout. The first few times was great. I really enjoyed it. Got to see the department. Got to see the the tiny little corners that we had people working out of. You know, <laughs> it's because I, I, I worked in the provincial building down the road. How many people here have worked in that building down there? I mean, it's nice on the outside. It's not nice on the inside. Do you know how many mice there are in that building? <laughs> anyway, so I, so the first few times I went walkabout was fine, but I tried to do it at least uh, you know once or twice a year to see everybody in the department to let them know that I knew they existed. How many of you have ever met a minister on a walkabout? Yeah, I see some ministers do walkabout. Some of you never have. Anyway, on one day, this was like at least a couple years into my time as a minister, I went on a walkabout and I ended up in the office of somebody who had just been let go. <gasps> It's like, I didn't know. I just went from door to door. Hey, how are you doing? What's going on? And, 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 and it was terrible. This is it was not funny at all. I mean, the guy was crushed. He was literally cleaning out his office when I was going around and walk about. And of course, I felt I had to, and I did. We closed the door. I sat there, and he told me what had happened. And, and well, there was really at that point, there's nothing you can do because because deputy ministers are very clear that personnel decisions are decisions that will be made by the deputy minister. That is not the minister's role. So it's not like there was anything I could do, but it was a very difficult situation. And I learned from that that there's maybe a good reason why deputies don't like when their ministers go walk about. Yeah. Speaking of walkabouts, you know, ministers sometimes have to be out of town, and um, in your book, you know, we'll recall there was, there was a section when you were doing kind of pre-budget tours, and you were kind of con consulting, pre-budget -pre consultations, I think, and they're part of the normal um, budget cycle, but you, you kind of made them very public, and, and the reform, and you were kind of traveling the province, so the work of the department has to continue while the uh, minister's away, so um, the second clip you, you selected it has to do with kind of ministers being out of town. So, do you want to maybe set that up for us and, and maybe tell us why you chose it? One of the reasons why I find yes ministers so funny is because, of course, there's a lot that goes on in government that we never see. Uh, one of the reasons why I think people enjoyed my first book was because I kind of lifted the curtain on what happens when politicians are talking to each other, what happens when the last civil servant leaves a room, what kind of conversations are held, what goes on, what are they thinking? And for me, it's the same. I wanted to know what are the civil servants saying about me? What are they saying about us, the politicians? Because you know that those conversations go on, right? And this clip, yeah, of course, I can't say whether this ever actually happened in my department because by definition, this was a meeting that I would be excluded from. And I don't know how much of this clip you have now, but it's what I think it is. Sir Humphrey explains to Bernard why it is actually a good idea to send your minister on trips. And when I saw this clip, it's like, I knew it. I knew they talked about us this way. Okay. Well, Bernard, how do you enjoy having your minister out of the office for a week? Oh, not very much. Haven't you? Oh, it makes things very difficult. Oh, but uh, the minister's absence is a godsend. <laughs> <laughs> he did the job properly for once. <laughs> no silly questions. 
questions, no bright ideas, no fussing about what the papers are saying. You know, Bernard, I sometimes think our minister doesn't believe that he exists unless he's reading about himself in the papers. I'll bet you the first thing he says when he gets into the office is, any press reports on my Washington speech? Uh, how much do you bet? A pound. Done. <laughs> uh, he won't, because he's already asked. <laughs> So you see why a minister's absence is a good thing? Oh yes, but so much work piles up. Does it? Yeah. What with a couple of days briefing before he goes, and debriefing and backlog, when he gets back, we can keep him out of the department's head for a fortnight. <laughs> then for the next six months, whenever he complains about not being involved about something, we can tell him he came up while he was away. <laughs> is this why they're having so many uh, summit conferences? Well, of course, that's the only way the country works. Concentrate all the power at number 10, then send the PM away to the EC summits, NATO summits, Commonwealth summits, anywhere. Then the cabinet secretary will be on with running the country properly. <laughs> well, you ought to be seeing him now. Well, what do you think of the minister's Washington speech at Peter Road? British government administration is a model of loyalty, integrity, and efficiency. It's a ruthless war on waste, cutting bureaucracy to the bone. Listen, Britain can teach the world. Is it true? Can we prove it? Oh, bad. A good speech isn't one where we can prove the minister is telling the truth. It's one in which nobody else can prove that he's lying. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> but uh, even so, I... Uh, yeah? Uh, well, I'm sure Peter did a frightfully good job and everything, but I just uh, wondered whether perhaps it might have been a bit boring for the audience. Well, of course it was boring. <laughs> but what the pants off them? <laughs> Asking that to sit through it, I should think. Oh, well, then, I mean. Well, the minister's speeches aren't written for the audience they're speaking to, Bernard. Oh, no. To keep the bring a speech, it's just a formality you have to go through in order to get the press release into the paper. You can't worry about entertaining people. We're not script writers for a comedian. Well, not a professional one, anyway. Uh, I just love that clip because, you know, this is one of the reasons why this series is so good because it goes from the benefits of sending ministers away on trips to how to write a speech for a minister. Well, of course it's boring, because it, the purpose of a ministerial speech is just to justify the issuance of a news release, right? That's the only reason you do it, so you're not there to entertain the audience, and I delivered a lot of boring speeches in my time, so what, I, I just love that kind of thing, because that rings true to me, and although it's comedy, and although it's satire, yeah. it's like, yeah, that's what that's the way it works. And that's the way civil servants talk about us. <laughs> so this is a series that stars a trio of middle-aged men. Uh, there's no sense that this is a, a fairly dry topic. Why do you think we're still talking about the series uh, 40 years later? Uh, to me, the reason is that there is comedy inherent in our political system. And that is that we we have non-expert ministers who have very little or no knowledge, but they have the authority, and you have civil servants who have a lot of knowledge but don't have the ultimate authority. That is actually one of the strengths of our system. But oh my goodness, you can play it for comedy. And and what the, the danger, I think, that is that sometimes it can make people depressed or cynical or it can make them despair because you just can't get through to the minister. But it is actually one of the strengths of our system is that you have to persuade a non-expert of what it is that you think ought to be done before it gets to be done. And that's not an easy thing to do. And I think we're talking about it because as long as we have the political system we have, that tension is always going to be there, and the writers of the series just brilliantly put their finger on the comedy that is inherent in the way that we run our government. And so as long as we have the system of government, yes, this is going to be relevant. And one of the things I've done since being invited here is just on Twitter, every once in a while, I'll, I'll just... Uh, search for the phrase, yes, minister. And every day from around the world, there are dozens of people writing tweets with the phrase, yes, minister, in it because people are recognizing scenes and personalities and the comedy in events happening every day in democracies around the world. We, we were talking about this uh, 
just a few minutes before we, we started. So as you know, a year and a half ago, I, nobody else knows, but I started up a, a robot account on Twitter. Uh, and so I called the, the account, uh, was it Sir Humphrey Applebot? Oh. And he, he takes quotes from the series and he tweets them three times a day. So he'll post, you know, kind of post advice to the minister three times daily. And in a year and a half, he went from zero subscribers, zero followers, to 18,000, pushing <laughs> just about 20,000 now. So, and you're right, people replying to him every day, um, sharing their stories, sharing news clips that, and, and the, the, the quotes that are put in the series are kind of pulled at random, but sometimes the timing is impeccable. <laughs> so it, it's just a beautiful thing to, to watch and see it kind of take it its own way. So, Maybe, maybe just to conclude, I wonder if, you know, have, have any other kind of yes minister moments occurred to you as, as minister? Is there a story you can kind of share with us to kind of uh, to take with us? Those are the main ones, the one, the clips that I selected, and especially this idea of the walkabout and the terrible experience I had with the walkabout eventually. But just that was your story. That was my yeah, story, and I just and, and uh, a misfire on my part. <laughs> and, and uh, but I just think, it, yeah, it's true, and, and I do think politicians should watch the series when they become ministers. Mm -hmm. But civil servants can learn a lot from it as well, because uh, one of the points of the show, I think, is that the two sides they both mean well, and they're both smart in their own way, but they're coming at it from different angles. And I can assure you as somebody, I've been a civil servant in the past, by the way, so uh, I can also sort of understand where you all are coming from. Um, a long, long time ago, I worked at the Workers' Compensation Board of Nova Scotia uh, in, at, on staff there. But I can tell you as a politician that you can learn a lot about what your minister's thinking right now, today, by watching Jim Hafner and saying, well, what's he thinking about? What are his priorities? What's motivating him to do what he's doing? And those same things are truly what's motivating your minister right now today. Great. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, that was wonderful. So uh, we're going to keep the show going. All right. It's um, our next guest is uh, Deputy Minister Simone Dolphman. So please welcome Deputy Dolphman. <laughs> so a, a tough act to follow. Yes. Um, Deputy Dolphman, you are a wildlife photographer who on the side uh, works as a Deputy Minister of Energy and Mines as well as the Deputy Minister for seniors. That's right? correct. It's the other way around. Right, yeah. right, right. So seniors have well, it for... Well, I've is my therapy. I don't think about breathing notes. Um, has it ever occurred to you... Oh, I have to issue a disclaimer before we oh, get going. We, we can do that in a moment, but th th this is kind of... Okay. Um, has it ever occurred to you to merge the two departments, the energy of energy mines and seniors? Are yeah, there any kind no, of synergies? There are, you know, we, we made the jokes and I've heard them a uh, lot of times. That's right, Joe. There's the, lots of the, energy and seniors, and that's part of our mandate at seniors. We're saying the glass is not half empty, it's half full. We're no. maximizing the opportunity that an aging population presents. So you've heard the jokes. Do the, do the jokes about the office of seniors ever get old? To do it too. Uh, I heard Lorraine. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, okay, you've got a disclaimer. I do, yeah. I do. You know, as in the show, you know, seniors, uh, de deputy ministers, and so on are always uh, sorry. Uh -huh. well, I'll they're keep, always, I'll keep on. They're always covering their derrieres, you know, and being conservative. And everything, so. I'll, I'll, I'll continue on with your bio while you kind of dig up. Sure. No, I've got it right here. Okay, great. Given that Graham was my minister. What follows here is fiction. The characters, incidents, and locations provided in the names herein are fictitious. An enemy similarity to or identification with the location, name, character, or history of any person, living or dead, product, or entity is entirely coincidental and unintentional. Okay. It's like, I'm really cute, right? Yeah, okay. I, I give it at the beginning of every meeting. Um, <laughs> so, so prior to becoming deputy minister, who's the, the office of seniors in, in the department, you were also deputy minister of 
EOUT, I'll call it. That's right. Um, and previous to that, you worked for the federal government for 17 years. I did. In various um, areas, Health Canada, uh, Industry Canada, uh, and ACOA, each with their own kind of cultural differences and yep. experiences. So, um, I guess, you know, my first question is, how true to life is the series? Are we, are we launching a documentary, or, or is, this, is this truly fiction, you know, to your disclaimer, kind of where does it fall on that spectrum? I, I think the brilliance of the program and its comedy was the fact that in everything that they, they exaggerated, there was a hint of truth. There was a little bit, it had to have a little bit of credible truth to be funny, that you took it in. If you exaggerated something that never could happen, it wasn't funny. So uh, for me, it was my interest in, you know, like go through YouTube clips and stuff like that. And one of the things I was looking through was mining it for the glimpse of truth, you know, just being very realistic in what parts of that was actually happens in some way. And so this, you know, you've been a deputy for some time, you have 17 years with the Federal Civil Service. D does, the clip, does the series come up? Like how often does it, does it come up on an annual basis? Does it, do you hear it? No, I don't really, I mean, not on a regular basis, but I think we, you know, when we're making jokes, we make similar jokes to the jokes there. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a good platform. Yeah. I mean, one of the, 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 you know, Graham spoke to the, the difference between the, the elected officials and, and the professional civil service, and um, you know, there's expertise and, and kind of tenure on one side, and then there's kind of, um, you know, decision making power, but but not always as many years experience. So, and then one of the other kind of distinctions is on the elect, elected official side, you get to make decisions. You set policy and uh, deputy ministers like yourself and your departments uh, implement. So, I mean, one of the clips you chose, and I think it's an incredible clip, and in fact, um, Lorraine flagged it as, as a, a great clip. You stole the clip. <laughs> well, that was your first choice. So, I mean, I think it says something that the two of you arrived at this next clip um, independently. Uh, I wonder if you can just kind of set it up and, and you know, arrive, share with us why you chose this clip. We'll, we'll watch it, we'll talk about it, but just maybe set it up. Sure. Uh, I chose it. It's a bit of a, it's a clip around what, is, what do the bureaucrats really think about the policies they're implementing on behalf of their political bosses who have the issue? who have the authorities who've been elected by citizens to make the policy decisions and set the directions. And, uh, I mean, the current context for this is if you go down to the states, it's safe for me to talk about U.S. politics and the Canadian ones or Nova Scotia ones. I mean, we have immigration judges who are leaving the public service because, or they're leaving their post because they took on their job because of a passion maybe for helping immigrants get into the country and make it a better world, and now they're being encouraged to to, or not encouraged, told by law to implement policies that are counter to why they joined the public service, why they took on the jobs they did, and to implement policies that they have a, an allergic reaction to implementing. And and the conversation I want to have, it's, it's based on a comedy, it's a more serious one for public service to think about, is, you know, what does a public servant do when you might be allergic to implementing the policy? Uh, and, and this is playing out more in the States. I mean, We'll talk a bit more after the clip about how it plays out maybe in Canadian or Nova Scotian context versus the U.S. one right now. But the U.S. one is exaggerating the context. Great. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's see the clip. Minister, government isn't about good and evil. It's only about order or chaos. Mm -hmm. And it's in order for Italian terrorists to get British bombs. And you don't care. It's not my job to care. That's what politicians are for. My job is to carry out government policy. Even if you think it's wrong, well, almost all government policy is wrong. <laughs> Frightfully well, can you? <laughs> Humphrey, have you ever known a civil servant to resign on a matter of principle? I should think not. What's an appalling system? <laughs> the first time I fully understand that you are purely committed to means and not to ends. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Minister, and all of my colleagues, there is no difference between means and ends. If you believe that, you will go to hell. <laughs> Minister, I have no idea you had a theological bent. <laughs> you are a moral vacuum. If you say so, Minister. It's time for your lunch appointment, Minister. 
You'll keep him very quiet, Bernard. What would you do about us? I would keep very quiet. <laughs> matter of the arms sales. No, we may not. I have to telegraph personally. Make an appointment for you, would you, Bernard? This is just the sort of thing that the Prime Minister wants to know about. I assure you, Minister, this is just the sort of thing that the Prime Minister desperately wants not to know about. We shall see about that. <sighs> Indeed, we will. What's the matter, Bernard? Oh, nothing really, sir. You look unhappy. Well, I was just wondering if the minister was right, actually. Very unlikely. What about? <laughs> about ends and means. I mean, will I end up as a moral vacuum, too? <laughs> oh, I hope so, Bernard. <laughs> if you work hard enough. Don't you feel rather downcast? If it's our job to carry out government policies, shouldn't we believe in them? <laughs> what an extraordinary idea. <laughs> in the past 30 years. If I believed in all their policies, I would have been passionately committed to keeping out of the common market and passionately committed to going into it. I would have been utterly convinced of the rightness of nationalizing steel and of denationalizing it and renationalizing it. In capital punishment, I would have been a fervent retentionist and an ardent abolitionist. I would have been a Keynesian and a Friedmanite, a grammar school preserver and destroyer, a nationalization freak and a privatization maniac, but above all, I would have been a stark staring raving schizophrenic. <laughs> so some jokes don't age as well as others, but uh, there's an element of truth in that one. I mean, can I call you some more? Yes. Okay, I should have cleared that before. That's all right. Yeah, Deputy Dontremont. Um, I mean, has that happened to you where you're, you're tasked with implementing a policy and, and not just an uh, not just a policy that you're lukewarm about, a policy that you really think is not the right um, approach. It and, and how do you how do you manage that? Personally? Yeah, I would classify it as you know. I think the issue is as deputy ministers, our job is to provide good good policy analysis, provide fearless policy advice for our political bosses to make them. They don't want to be sold to this. You know, here's three options. I think you should take this one. This toaster's got three three settings for heat, and you know they don't want to be sold a product. They want to be given the facts and help make the right decision. I think something that deputy ministers develop over time, and it's maybe easier for us than our other staff, is at the end of the day you give your advice, they make a decision, and you go home knowing you've done the best job you can, and you implement decisions that are legally taken loyally as if they're your own, with enthusiasm. But at the end of the day, if governments make, don't make the decision that you would have made, you don't, you know, you don't lose sleep over that. For some of our staff, sometimes they're so enthusiastic about the things they do and the way they want to do them. There's a saying, it's not a government saying, but it's broader, a broader saying, you know, uh, don't fall in love, fall in love with the problem, not your solution to the problem. You know, sometimes you think your way of solving the problem is the right way and someone chooses another way. As, as Graham mentioned, government is not about right or wrong, or it's about different choices. Governments have different choices and different priorities that they, that they can make. Don't fall in love with your version of the priorities. I mean, the, the situation was different, I'd say, in our context than it is in the US one, where an immigration lawyer resigns over not wanting to implement those policies. It's not like the folks at Department of Health, that there's a government that's gonna come later and be anti-health. You know, their job is going to be to undo health. Governments will make different choices about how to advance health care, and I'm confident all the staff that are there can get behind the idea of advancing health care, even if, if it's a different way that's been done in the past. So, but, I mean, I don't have the answer to your question. To, to, to the issue, you know, in the U.S. context, where people are being asked to implement policies that they're really, their moral compass tells us is going in the right direction, the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. What is it their job to do, or what should they do? Should they just hold their nose and do it, or should they, you know, or some people go as far as resigning? But, you know, it, it's a different context there, I think, because the way they're running government there is quite a bit of a shift in the way it's been done in the past. Right. But it's something. It's interesting, I think, public service policy conversation to have. Right. 
I mean, one of the one of the themes that keeps on popping up in in schools of public administration, and I know a lot of folks in the room here either are MPA students uh, or they they study public administration and public policy, or political science, or kind of a related field. Um, but one of the themes that keeps on coming up in these programs is that public servants no longer have a monopoly on advice to their ministers. Um, there might have been a golden period in the 60s, if there ever was a golden uh, golden era of public administration. Uh, and, and back then, you know, the, the, the professional public service was, was the main advisor to, to elected officials. But now there's, there's a critique of that, or an argument that, that you know, uh, advice to ministers now comes from think tanks, comes from academics, it comes from schools, it comes from the media, it comes from, you know, a whole plethora of actors. So, you know, watching the series, we see um, Sir Humphrey trying to kind of manage the minister, and I think, that's, that might be an exaggeration of what happened back then, and certainly uh, there's, a, there's a departure from, from real life today, but I mean, how, how much does the civil service, how much influence do they have if, if they really do uh, uh, have great advice? Like, do, do you find like it, you can't change the minister's mind, and, and of course, the, your goal isn't, your, your objective isn't to change your mind, but, how different is it today with, with all of the different actors in the policy field? It's different, but I think I think it's, they're all valuable inputs. Uh, none of us are as smart as all of us. And and political our political bosses have a broader frame of decision making than we do as public servants. We give them advice on what the, the department thinks, maybe a broader view of what policy advice from different departments think, but their their context is very, very broad in terms of you know, their constituents and and uh, alignment with their political platform and a number of things. So, um, you know, their their context is different and all those inputs I think are important. You know, the role of the deputy minister in, in part is like being a translator. We need to take, we're kind of the sandwich in the middle between the political world and, and the, the, the public service. Uh, and our job is to translate good policy into to make it make sense in the political world for our political bosses. But also, after an election, it's for us to take their political platform and find a way to convert that into policy action. So we're kind of the, the people who translate policy into politics and politics and policy. Not that we design political platforms, but we need to make it make sense in their political world. And how do you, I mean, part, part of being an effective advisor um, and, and deputy minister is establishing a trust relationship with, with your minister. Um, you know, series like these portray the deputy as a kind of managing, all-knowing kind of <laughs> character, which, which might undermine that kind of trust, trusted advisor relationship. How do you how do you establish that? You know, if you have a new minister, or if you're if you you're assigned to energy and mines or the office of seniors, how do you establish the trust with your minister early uh, on? It's interesting to say that one of my motivations to I, I remember the program as, as when I was younger, but one of my rekindle my interest was when I was appointed as a deputy minister eight years ago now. Uh, I watched the series, I bumped into the series on YouTube and watched parts of it again, and I was interested in the relationship. Because I remember, my memory about the program was telling me about the stiff relationship between yes minister, yes deputy, between the deputy and the minister, and I was interested in minding it for, is that the way the relationship should really be? At the end of the day, the relationship that a deputy has with their minister and minister's relationship is as different as there are different people mm -hmm. at the end of the day. You know, I know some deputies who, after work or in other governments, will go have a beer with their minister and call them by their first name, and others will call the minister and minister. And I've told ministers, you can call me Simon, and then some of them will say, yes, deputy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, 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 the formality and so on is as different as there are different people. So. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. much. It's fine. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much, Deputy Tomshawn. Uh, our next guest is Lorraine Glendenning. So, Lorraine, welcome. Please welcome uh, Lorraine. So, this is really is the, the ERDT reunion. Uh, so Lorraine, you began your career in government as a very junior minister. Not a minister. Uh, very junior. Person. Oh, jeez, I can't read. Can I? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, a very junior member of the Irish government Rainbow Coalition press office. You worked for the Red Bit in the Rainbow. Um, the Democratic left, it was called then. During your time there, you witnessed the early part of the peace process, the end of the IRA ceasefire at Canary Wharf. You witnessed the Clintons visiting. You witnessed a six-month Irish presidency of the EU. Um, you saw the election of Tony Blair, uh, including being yelled at by his press secretary, Alistair Campbell. Highlight of my career. No kidding, yeah. Um, and I think there's, a, there's another series in the UK um, based on kind of ministerial kind of uh, public administration, They're more contemporary, but it has an Alistair Campbell type character that think of it, right? That there's a rumor that, you know, that it's based off Alistair. It's based off of Alistair, yeah. And it was, the other rumor is that it was funded by Peter Mandelson, which apparently is not true. No. So after that, you, sp uh, you spent some time uh, in crown corporations, in the private sector, uh, before heading back to the Prime Minister's office to help establish the National Centre for Workplace Partnership and Performance. Uh, a theme we'll come back to. Um, you came to Canada in 2005. You had your first job working as a researcher with Nova Scotia's NDG. I was Graham's researcher. <laughs> <laughs> really is a reunion, isn't it? Yeah. I used to sit behind Graham at public accounts and Graham would ignore my questions that I had spent all weekend writing. <laughs> 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 criticism was, was that they wouldn't answer the questions that you would get. Um, and so um, then you moved to the provincial government, uh, to what was then ERBT, uh, and you worked for the broadband uh, for World Nova Scotia Initiative for two years, military development. After stint at Treasury Board office, uh, I think where I met you, we had an office across from each other. Um, you moved to Service Nova Scotia, internal services it's now called. Uh, and that's where you are today. You're the director of strategy and performance. That's correct. Yes. Okay, we covered. We covered. That's okay. my long um, and varied career in the public service. That's quite a career. Um, so you have a kind of unique background. We haven't got to Kevin yet, but you know you've lived in Europe, uh, right next to the UK. Um, Tell, tell us maybe how you first came across the series and when it first entered your life. Well, um, it was from the beginning. Um, and um, in Ireland, we had BBC. You could get BBC. And uh, it was required viewing for Irish people. Um, and uh, Yes Minister was required viewing as well because we were always watching them to see. Because they were always at it, as they, the Brits. <laughs> they were at it, like something or other. But so we, we watched British television and listened to British radio very intently. And just to give you a bit of context for the series, I mean, it was started in 1980. Margaret Thatcher had just swept into power, um, and she set about dismantling British society as it existed after the war. Um, so she was, um, she had a great privatization scheme. She was destroying the miners' um, union. She was closing down the collieries. She was selling off all the social housing stock. She was privatizing the assets. And um, and then um, in Ireland, it was you know the hunger strikes and the super grass trials and the shoot to kill policy that the RUC were, um, were 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 undertaking at the time. And her attitude towards the troubles and towards uh, Sinn Féin IRA was extremely, you know, strict and she was she didn't think they were political prisoners, she forced them to become common criminals and all that kind of thing. So it was a really, really, really tumultuous and, um, and strange period um, and there was, you know, huge poverty. Um, it was, the 80s were shit. <laughs> Anyone who complains about how the world is now really needs to go back and look at the 80s because they were pretty awful, you know? And so it was in that context. One, one good thing from the 80s. But, uh, yeah, well, it was in that context that this was this little spark of joy, right? It was this little spark of these, these men who were like the problem really but it was an opportunity to kind of laugh at them every week. And it was sort of, it was Spitting Image was the other show that was, um, I don't know if you've seen that with the puppets, um, and the Spitting Image 
course, had the American singers as well, because while all this was going on in New York, you had Reagan and all that stuff, right? So, so that's the context. So yeah, it was, it was required viewing. And in my house, it was absolutely required viewing because my father was a veterinary surgeon and his nemesis was the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> and um, yeah, so yeah. So <laughs> we always watched it and then we had to listen to that go on about the Department of Agriculture. <laughs> So you had a, a, a great career in the public service in, in Ireland, and then a, a great career in Nova Scotia in the public service here. Uh, were, there, were there moments in your career, whether here or Ireland, uh, that you felt, oh my God, I'm living, I'm, I'm in the middle of an episode, you know, Bernard's about to tap me on the shoulder, you know, has, has it happened to you where you said, this is, this is, this is, this is straight from the series? Um, well, there were many. Um, and the one I'm going to talk about, <laughs> Um, it's, it's just a funny story, but uh, it's the one I the one I always love to tell because um, so it was in 1995 and the Clintons were coming to Ireland and it was a really big deal because we had stopped shooting each other and as a reward Bill and Hill were coming for a party and it was such a big deal so um, we were so excited um, and then um, so then the planning started and I was the most junior person on the planning team. And um, a plane load of Americans landed, and there was like 70 of them, and they all were like six foot four, and they had really white teeth, and nobody had white teeth at that stage. And uh, we used to sit in this conference room, and they would go through this endless list of details, and we would just sit there and be told how it was going to be by these Americans. And so it was great, and then it was okay, and then it was getting really annoying, and then it was just like, it's, you know, it's our country, and then it was, you know, and then we just all sat there, mule silence. And then one day, we were going through some aspect of security, I think it was, we were talking about manholes or something, and we were going to have to seal up all the manholes in Dublin city centre, and, um, and the, the head security guy said, said oh, no, oh, we're, we're going to need some snipper dogs, and uh, we were like snipper dogs, and he's going, well, we're going to need 12 teams, and uh, we're like 12 teams. Of and sniffer then, dogs? Or? Of sniffer dogs, okay. yeah. And, uh, and then the guy from the Garda dog unit, the Garda are the police in Ireland, the guy from the Garda dog unit went, uh, oh, lads, I'm very sorry, no, but uh, we're, we're in the middle of a bit of transition with the Garda dog unit, so some of the lads have retired, unfortunately, and uh, some of the young pups now, we haven't actually done the explosives training on them yet, <laughs> we have the drug thing going on, but we have Bessie, and she's a great girl, and Bessie is fully committed, and they do a great job. <laughs> Uh, 
so you, you selected a clip from us from an episode of uh, Yes Minister season three, episode two, called Equal, Equal Opportunities. Well, maybe set, set that up for us, um, and, and we can talk about it after that too. So, at the beginning of this episode, Hagar is being interviewed by a young woman who's writing for the school newspaper, and she challenges him, and she says, so what have you done, really? Like, can you make, like, make, point to an achievement? And he can't, of course, because it's Hacker. And, um, and then he gets all worked up about it, and, um, and then his wife sees the opportunity and pushes for equal opportunities for women. And so he decides that he's going to introduce a quota of females in the senior ranks of the civil service. And, um, and then he tells Sir Humphrey. So Sir Humphrey is desperately trying to uh, stop this from happening. And this scene is the DM's meeting which as you know happens here every Monday morning. Uh, in Nova Scotia, I'm not saying this meeting is like this at all. It's just from 1982, so it's, I'm sure it's all changed since <laughs> But uh, I just thought it was really wonderful. Um, it's, our, it's really good, um, it's a really good thing to see. All right, that's all good. My minister is set on creating a quota of 25% women in the open structure, leading to an eventual 50%. Yes. Well, I must say that it seems right and proper to me that men and women be treated fairly and equally. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that we all feel that in principle there should be such targets set and goals achieved. Well, sir, I, I'm fully in favour of this idea. We must have some positive discrimination in favour of women. Of course, it wouldn't work for foreign common. It's wrong. It's really hell. We couldn't post women ambassadors to Iran when they're the Muslim nation. Well, 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 well. Most of the third world are not so advanced as we are in connection with women's rights, and as we have to send uh, diplomats to new postings every three years, this idea is obviously not for us, but our good book principle. No, excuse me, I'm not in favour of it. I think we need the feminine touch. Uh, women are better at handling some problems than men, no doubt about it. Uh, of course, we would have to make an exception as far as the Home Office is concerned. Uh, women are not the right people to run prisons or police. And quite often they wouldn't want to do it anyway. Yeah. Uh, but you do agree with the principle. Oh, yes, well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, the same applies to defence, alas, all those admirals and generals. And uh, it would be possible, of course, to appoint a woman as Head of security, for instance. And would have to become head. <laughs> <laughs> yes, defense is clearly a man's world, like industry and employment. Oh, uh, yes. trade union leaders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what about the DHSS, John? Well, I'm happy to say that women are well represented near the top of the DHSS. And after all, we have two of the four deputy secretaries currently in Whitehall. They're not eligible for permanent secretary, of course, because they're deputy chief medical officers, and I'm not sure they're really suitable for uh, uh, No, no, that's under. Of course, women are 80% of our clerical staff, and 99% of the type of the grade, so they're not doing too bad about them, are they? <laughs> and in principle, I'm in favour of them going to the left. Good, good. Well, I think the feeling of the meeting is, in principle, that we're all thoroughly in favour of equal rights for the ladies. Yeah. It's just that there are certain special problems in individual departments. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, what about this question of the quota? In fact, I have to tell you that I'm against it. Very yeah, yeah. Not the politicians. Mm -hmm. We must, in my view, always have the right to promote the best man for the job, regardless of sex. No. <laughs> Speaking as an ardent feminist myself, I think <laughs> In recruiting the right sort of women, married women with families tend to drop out because, in all honesty, they cannot give their work their full single minded attention. And unmarried women with no children are not fully around, and people will thoroughly understand that. <laughs> so, that in practice, it's rarely possible to find a fully around and married woman with a happy home and three children who's prepared to devote her whole life, or virtually her whole life, to a department. It's catch 22, really. Well, Catch 22, subparagraph A. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we must ensure that our respective ministers oppose this quota idea in Cabinet by drawing our own minister's attention to each department's own special problems. Mm. Uh, but we will, of course, uh, recommend the principle of equal opportunities at every level. Yeah. 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 Yes, just one more thing. Through the chair, I'd like to add that my minister also sees the promotion of women as a 
need to create greater diversity the top of the service. I think we should stress when briefing our ministers that quite frankly, we've got to find a more diverse lot than us. Real cross section of the nation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is new? What is that new? went out on television in 1982 when I was a 12 year old girl and I was thinking about what I was going to do with my life. Can you imagine the impact that had on me? And I actually rewatched that full episode yesterday evening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd say in preparation, but in procrastination. But uh, uh, there was another really great quote from, from the episode, which was, you know, now, Minister, if you're going to start appointing women just because they're best qualified for the job, you're going to create a lot of resentment in the, in the civil service. And I thought that was just brilliant. And so, you know, watching that scene, you know, speaking with you, uh, you know, based on your, your experience starting out your civil service career, uh, you know, how have things changed or how have things not changed? And, and have you noticed a jump between Ireland and, and uh, Nova Scotia? Or is it is this a change time based? Or are you really surprised at how little change? I, I think the. I think the um I think the demographic of the civil, of the civil service in, in uh, the Britain and the UK. I mean, you know, ten years after that aired, uh, Stella Rennington became the head of MI5, which is at the end that they're talking about. So M did become F in 1992, and there's been two M's since then, female M's since then. So I mean, I mean it's completely different now. It's completely different. In Ireland's completely different here. The the demographics are different. Women have you know broken through. The, the problem now is people are saying the same thing about equity candidates. And they're saying the same thing about people um, who have disabilities. And so the conversation hasn't changed. Just the people who are having the conversation have changed slightly. So that's really, uh, like I, I mean, I thought it was funny because it's old school, but I also wanted to play it because I feel like it's still really true. It's just not necessarily a bunch of old white guys saying it now, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Um, you know, a few people in, in the room haven't seen the series yet, and, and uh, there will be people joining the civil service over the next uh, years and decades who, who will, will be introduced to this one way or another. Uh, you know, what should they take away from the series if you can kind of um, draw kind of one conclusion? What, you know, when they're watching it, what should they keep in mind? I don't know. I mean, I, <laughs> I was, um, I've been thinking about this. So it's very, it's very interesting because the whole the whole point of the show is the push and pull between inertia and progress, and, and how you know the, the civil service is all about stability and order, and and how that is a, you know a great thing, but it's also can can you know we, we, we don't have a, we're not able to innovate and all that kind of stuff that we're always hearing about, um, and so. But if you look at Britain now, I don't know if any of you follow politics in Britain now, but the, you know, I mean, the civil service is tearing itself apart at the moment in Britain. And last week we had Priti Patel, who is the Home Secretary, who you know had people pulling all nighters, and civil servants ended up having to go to the hospital. And she's trying to oust her permanent secretary because of the way the policies are being driven through, and so that's no good either. <laughs> so. Um, I think we do it really well here. I think we are a small community and we just sit down and solve problems and we, you know, it's not formal here. Um, so I think, I, I, I come to Barry Humphrey really, I don't, I don't think I come to praise him really. <laughs> Lorraine, thanks very much. So, it would be hard to top that, uh, that story, but um, let's welcome our next guest, uh, Kevin Quick. Our next Welcome, Kevin. So I'll, I'll just I'll go, go through your bio when you get comfortable. And, and so uh, I think everyone in this room will know Kevin, but for the maybe one or two people who don't know Kevin, I'll, I'll do this just for you. Um, Kevin Quickly is a professor in Dalhousie School of Public Administration, faculty management. Uh, Kevin, you specialize in public sector risk and crisis management, strategic management, critical infrastructure protection, uh, thinking about what to do when everything goes wrong. 
Uh, you are, and I think a lot of people in the room will know you as a scholarly director of the McKechnie Institute uh, at Dalhousie University, which we are incredibly um, proud of and impressed, um, uh, and you put on incredible events uh, every year, um, and, and you've just um, finished up a, a few recent events which were quite popular. What I didn't know about you is that you served as a senior public servant in the Ontario government in the cabinet office. That was new to me. Um, but I do know that you taught policy analysis to public servants um, working in a variety of roles. Um, like Jim Hacker, Professor Quigley earned his master's from the London School of Economics. <laughs> so England. You then went on to do a PhD at Queen's University in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Then a fellowship at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. So a few years came here in the UK, just missing Wales. I have never stepped in Wales before. No never even stepped in it. No, that's right. Uh, I've stepped in it, just not stepped in Wales. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lost my notes. <laughs> Lorraine Glendenning is a. No, okay. Okay. So um, your your book, Too Critical to Fail: How Canada Manages Threats from Global Infrastructure, is published by McGill Queen's University Press. Um, November 2017, shortlisted for the Donner Prize, big award in the field of public policy and public administration. So, um, Kevin, you know, on, on going back to that question on the, the, the kind of spectrum between documentary and and uh, you know fiction, you know, uh, where do you think the series falls in, in your perspective? Documentary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so. One of the ways these clips um, propagate the generations is, is through MPA classes. So, actually, you use clips like these in your your, your MPA classes and your, your public policy classes. Well, why do you use this series? So, um, well, I say documentary, obviously I'm being facetious, but uh, I say documentary because I'm, I'm going to pick up on Lorraine's point that it's it was an incredibly serious mm -hmm. time for public administration. So. Here's something that's been profoundly disappointing for everybody uh, in this room. Uh, public administration is not always the sexiest topic outside <laughs> of the public administration community, all right? No, believe it or not, right? Not everybody thinks it's the sexiest topic. And in fact, some of the biggest reformers uh, who inspired books and grants and research projects, etc., uh, when they came to write their memoirs, would often talk about public administration reform in one page. Uh, it doesn't really get a lot of attention. Um, I love this series because it takes public administration very seriously. I mean, it's funny, but it takes it very, very seriously. And I absolutely agree. There's got to be a nugget of truth in it in order for the, the, the joke to work. Um, so I wouldn't say that I, uh, I, I mean, it's funny, I, I, but I use this as a teaching tool because for me, it represents a very dramatic period in public administration. Um, that, that gave public administration, however disappointing and depressing it might have been living through it, it gave public administration and scholars a heck of a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's pre-Margaret Thatcher and there's post-Margaret Thatcher, and they're so different. They're so different. And it's really rooted in a profound distrust of the public service mm -hmm. and breaking up the monopoly that the deputy had on information. And so, a lot of those changes, and we live with them today. So I think this is one of the reasons why it resonates, because um, privatization, outsourcing, um, league tables, citizen charters, all of these things to try to put more information in the public domain, to uh, break up the monopoly of information of the deputy, these are all legacies of that period that I, like now when governments think about doing things, of course it takes some time, to they, would they actually, would their first question be, um, uh, you know, how many public servants can we hire to, you know, build this bridge? <laughs> or would they immediately think, who's the private sector partner? Now we can call them partners, right? Um, they're sort of sharing responsibility, but it's like the whole language of government has changed so significantly since that period. Um, and so I think that, uh, for me, it, it was, it's just a very dramatic period where a lot of things changed. And when, and I don't think you can overstate it really. And 
And so when we think about partnering with the private sector, the public servants being the sort of policy makers and not the doers, et cetera, a lot of these reforms happen in the 80s. And so for me, a series like Yes Minister works because it happened in a moment. Not, it's not about the 80s. The yes, yes Minister is about the 70s for me. It's about profound public sector failure in the 70s that led to dramatic change in the 80s. And there was no changing, rolling that back. And so I, I love it for that, but I think, so lover or hater, when Margaret Thatcher, she gave public administration scholars a lot to think about, um, about how we do stuff. And I think it was quite profound. So I, I, that's why I'm really enjoying the show, because it, it's mocking the characters of the 70s that brought about that dramatic change in the 80s. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of, one of the themes that comes up in the series again and again is discretion, you know, keeping decisions on the inside. And, and one of the changes you get kind of following that is, okay, you know, we're gonna open things up. You know, we're going to let the public in. So, you know, your first clip, by the way, you broke the rules and you gave us a clip that's not from Yes Minister. Yeah. Uh, from Parks and Recreation. But he did also choose a Yes Minister. So maybe, so do you want to send sure. the first clip? Yeah. Sure, so when I, I used these clips in my class, and in fact, the day that you invited me to, to come was actually the day I was gonna go and do a lecture um, using these two clips. So I used these two clips back to back, and like any good uh, psychologist, teaching is a bit of psychology, you gotta start with where the client is. <laughs> and so starting with Parks and Rec is maybe a little easier when you're teaching an MPA class today than starting with Yes Minister, which looks like a bit of ancient history to a degree. Parks and Rec, although Parks and Rec's a little bit old too, but anyway, um, Parks and Rec, um, there's, there's a clip here about public engagement. And so I think it's, it's a nice place to start because Parks and Rec is playing the same game the Yes Minister's playing. It's mocking issues around public engagement and how do we do public engagement. I'm sure many public servants in the room are familiar with the challenges now of your minister saying we need to do more public engagement, we need to do more town halls, but how do you do it and how do you do it effectively? And uh, that's a very significant public management challenge to do it in a meaningful way. So that's the setup for this particular clip. Uh, keeping in mind the theme tonight about Yes Minister, then I'll get to Yes Minister in a minute, but this is the clip. What I hear when I'm being yelled at is people caring loudly at me. Now, I have a few things I want to say about Laura Lennon. There is a disturbing lack of benches in Ranchin Park. I want to sit for I found a sandwich in one of your parks, and I want to know why it didn't have mayonnaise. <laughs> What's so funny? Oh. Why are you some kind of moron? <laughs> why don't you have pen dryers in the park bathrooms? There's so much more sanitary than paper towels. Anyone know that? And the ladies. And the ladies. And the ladies. Except for Tarna. Except for Tarna. My daughter's five. Well, your daughter is an idiot. Her daughter is an idiot. Her daughter is an idiot. Oh, no. Her daughter is an idiot. Oh, no. Up and shut down. Who's going to stop them cutting? But isn't all food bad for you? I've been eating lasagna and muffins every day of my life for 40 years, and I feel too. Do not drink the sprinkler water, so I made some tea with it, and now I have an infection. Sir? <laughs> sir, are, 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 are you listening to me, sir? Sir, I'm talking to you! Sir, sir, are you aware that there is waste in your water supply? Oh, you promise! You promise? That's not fair! Anyway, the other question of fairness is separation. I'm going to Russia, Tommy. And you go back to Russia. What's next? Income? Sir, you don't pay your income tax? Whether or not I pay income tax is none of the government's business. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually it actually is. Well, you don't know my name or what I look like, so I'm good about finding it. How do we know you're really a nurse? Why don't we just set fire to the facts, you know? Set it ablaze? That's awesome. Well, let's leave that up to lawyers. The point is, it would work. This that's happening here is not a lie. <laughs> okay. Good choice. So, so... What is that? What is? What, what are you showing us? How do we get to the answer from here? So yeah. I think one of the things I really like about this clip, first of all, is to show that uh, my students can identify and relate to, and it, it's it's funny, it's it's exaggerated, but there's a kernel of truth in it as well. But how do we do public meaningful public engagement, and how do we deal with the hysteria? And this is is this really what democracy looks like? I mean, this is chaotic and this is crazy. Um, I'm, I'm but just wondering, it, is that what the Pre-budget consultation looked like. Was that reasonable? 
Exactly. Yeah. So, um, but what it, it leads us to is a conversation about uh, engagement and transparency, which gets me to Yes Minister and the reaction against an earlier time, which led to this kind of problem. So our appetite for public engagement, our appetite for town hall meetings, and transparency, et cetera, the emphasis we place on that now is, is a pendulum swing. And it's swinging quite dramatically away from what happened in the 1970s when we had guest minister where no one was allowed to look behind the curtain. And so that's what leads to this second clip, mm -hmm. the second clip yeah. where the the issue here, and I'll just mention it's about, uh, they make reference to Cerveso and a chemical spill and uh, an explosion that was very dramatic, killed a lot of people, and um, uh, someone comes to see the minister to ask about an inquiry, about maybe there should be an inquiry because she's experienced, she thinks the water's contaminated in her particular community, and she thinks, she thinks it's something like a chemical. That was that was contaminated cerveza. It's not always clear when she says cerveza, so I don't make that point. So keeping in mind, I don't talk about transparency and engagement. How did we end up with Parks and Rec? It's because we had this problem 40 years ago. The Yes Minister was trying to bring to our attention the lack of transparency in public service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Secretary, all those dynamics, and that actually knowing Greek 
was important. Mm -hmm. But the criticism of the public service in the 70s was that I'm glad you know your Greek, mm -hmm. but can you manage an economy for us? Because the, the economy was a mess. The UK economy had some major disasters in the 1970s, and the public service was seen to be removed from it, that they were not touched by the huge unemployment, the huge inflation, the disaster of the economy, the currency crisis. Their jobs were protected. Mm -hmm. And so there was a great resentment towards the public service that Thatcher really captured and, brought and really went about dismantling. So I, I see a lot of those themes coming through in that clip about the power dynamics, the lack of transparency, no inquiry, no look here. Uh, and then you, it leads to a, this pendulum swing of dramatic efforts at public engagement, which lack coherence, craziness, uh, you know, Herculean efforts to have town hall meetings, but how do we draw meaningful interactions in those town hall meetings? So that would be my sort of bias in this kind of approach in public administration, thinking of it as a pendulum that swings back and forth from particular ideologies, and I think it's captured nicely by these two clips. So this is why I show mm -hmm. these two clips. Interesting that uh, February 25th, uh, the first episode of Yes Minister, the title and theme of the episode was called Open Government. Oh, that is funny. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we did receive a question from a mystery person in the audience with the initial W. Uh, this probably came two speakers ago, but I just found it. No, um, I cannot revisit their mark. Okay. So, but, but it speaks to your point about kind of breaking the monopoly of advice, um, but it also might, might touch on walkabouts. I suspect the question first came in, but the question is kind of, what do you, uh, did anybody submit the question? And, and you can, yes, Valerie, okay. Um, so, do you, do, you, do you want to maybe ask the question? I think it was a great question, yeah. Well, I think it was in response to what Simone was saying uh, about deputies sort of trying to give very clear advice to ministers. And in my experience working in government, I think, my question was, wouldn't, wouldn't ministers, wouldn't we all be better off if ministers had the full range of advice? That, that some people think this and other people think that. And, you know, this might be what we're recommending, but there, there is a full range of advice, and in my experience, it seems that ministers are getting kind of a sanitized version of things, or they could be. And I, I just wanted, the question was, wouldn't we do it better off if they had a fairer group? And did everybody hear that? So the question is, yeah, would the ministers be better off if they got the full range of opinions rather than a, a single sanitized uh, version of advice from the deputy? So, of course, I'm, I'm with, in company that I'm sure would have a strong and thoughtful views on that. I think the, uh, ostensibly you want to say, sure, I mean, put more views in. I think also, practically speaking, a deputy's job is to try to limit the discussion and try to get a decision out of the minister. So you really need to go from, well, actually, one of the exercises I get in my class when I ask them to work develop policy options is how many do you develop? It depends where you are in the process of, of development. Sometimes it's seven options, sometimes it's three. Uh, as a scholar, I would say that this particular period for me makes me think about public choice theory, though, that there's a profound distrust of the public services. This notion that the public servant is there to serve or do the public good was really questioned profoundly in this period, that, that we shouldn't be thinking of public servants uh, in, in, as any special beings that are doing public service for the good, but that they're self-serving rational actors, and we need to think about them that way. And so there's a power dynamic at play, and it's the deputy's interest, not these deputies, but there's, a, there's an interest to control and control the minister. And uh, this is what these reforms are about. This is what this show is about, in my view. Uh, and that I think that public choice theory is a very different way to think about public service, because we often talk about the value of public service and the, the good-hearted people that are in it. Public choice theory takes a very cynical and I don't think we've ever really gone beyond the impact that that theory has had on the way we think about public service, not in the academic community. We're much more skeptical about motives, about the public service motives. And my motive right now is to keep us running on time. So thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> I think this is all night. But, um, thank you, Kevin. Our next guest uh, is the Deputy Minister, um, Duff Montgomery. Please welcome Duff Montgomery. It kind of feels like David Letterman. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Deputy Montgomery, you've been a deputy minister 
since 2007. You are now the Deputy Minister of Culture and Advanced Education. Previously served as Deputy Minister of uh, Natural Resources. Before that, Deputy Minister of Health Promotion and Protection. Rearranged since then. Uh, you've got a good clip coming out that relates to health promotion. Uh, you bring a unique perspective, having first worked in the civil service, uh, and then you, you also have the experience of working uh, in the premier's office and in the minister's office. So from so the, the uh, permanent official side to the, the elected official side, and then and then back to the the civil service side. So you you kind of seen things from the party side, the hacker side, and, and the sort of country side. If I can kind of put it that way. Um, I mean, how, how how true is this series? And and do you have any do you have any stories? Is this you know, has this sort of yes minister moment happened to you uh, over the course of your career? So if I can, was it Valerie who asked the question? Yeah. Let me give you my answer. I have a phrase that I use with my team, get everybody in the room. I think Valerie left the room up. No. I'll just <laughs> pass it along. Get now. everybody in a room. Because it's so important that, and I serve four premiers, three different political parties. The advice that you give to premiers and ministers has to be reflective of what the people are thinking. And they have to know what all sides of the people are thinking. So it's our job to be objective and talking to union leaders versus employers versus university presidents and student leadership. And when you get in front of your minister or your premier, premier, this is what's concerning these folks. This is what's concerning these folks. This is what's concerning these folks. So what do you recommend? I recommend we get them all in the room. Talk about their differences and try to find a way that you're able to go back to your elected officials uh, to give them options on a potential solution. So that's my style, and I think it's important to relate that. Because yes, minister, when I first started watching you, I wasn't a deputy minister, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but when I re-engaged with yes, minister, which was when Jamie Muir became minister of health, and all hell was breaking loose. You know, he's new minister of health. So when I was trying to find a way to help him loosen up, and one of the great scenes in the, in the Yes Minister was the hospital built in the middle of nowhere. And there's one in Nova Scotia built in the middle of nowhere, between Port Hawkesbury and Ilma Dam, for political reasons. Because the government couldn't decide which community to put it in. So I said to, to Jane, remember the scene where the minister is really perturbed? He's going to question here, he's got to explain. Why is the hospital at home? What am I going to say? He says to his deputy. The deputy says, not a problem, sir. You just tell them that the health policies of your government are working so well, the hospitals only have full. <laughs> so, I mean, anyway, a lot of interesting uh, dynamics. I the other thing, if I can yes, think of, of course. I want to get a little humor in here. Um, I look at West Wing, turn this <laughs> I look at West Wing, and I look at this, and I want to meet the writers. I want to meet the writers. Because, man, did they ever nail it. And if you watched West Wing, and I was in the premier's office when we were watching West Wing, and my wife would say to me, are they always walking and talking like that? <laughs> Graham will know this too. They're always moving and walking. I said, oh, yeah, that's the way it is. So um, the show, I view Yes Minister as a kind, warm show where they treat each other with respect, with humor but they get at serious social issues in a wonderfully kind of way. And that's why I enjoy it. So I think we're, we're due for a, a little reminder. So um, we'll start with your first clip. You had three really good ones to start with. First Context clip. real quick, is it the tobacco one? Uh, not yet, it's, it's uh, what was called the next prime minister. Yeah. Oh, the next prime minister. <laughs> Self-explanatory, yeah. when you get to the clip where he's, they're talking about the next prime minister and what's important, you're going to love this one. I think it's the campaign for the freedom of information, by the way. Sorry, I can't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll pause it there, yeah. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that was a shimmer to 
splice it. It does go on, but, but yeah, I thought that might be what you So what we're going to be emphasis on creative information. Oh, what are you going to do? Can't tell you. Yeah. There's it's a little fun and irony in, in, in all of that. Freedom of information, the way I treat freedom of information, if I get a media request, I will say, why don't we bring that person in? Why make them go through a formal process? Bring them in, put them in front of staff, and what, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. At least they'll get from my staff or whoever a perspective of what they're asking for. And I'm going to tell you, we have an amazing relationship with me. They don't come at us when we deserve to come at, but they also know we try to be open and transparent. So you were deputy minister of health promotion uh, and protection. The next scene, totally your your game. Uh, so so why don't you set that one up for us? So that's that's the smoking clip. So I'm in Premier Ham's office, and Premier says, uh, "I'm going to introduce no smoking in public places legislation." Oh, okay, Premier. Context. Very courageous decision. Context. A conservative Premier. Okay, he has a caucus. And you need to understand the caucus is the lifeblood of the political party. Because it's in the caucus room where real views get put forward. As Disraeli would say, was told when he was in the front bench, his exchequer was telling him, those people across the aisle, don't you worry, Prime Minister, we got them. And Disraeli goes, it's the one behind me that I worry about, the caucus. So let's set the context. Premier Hand, conservative Premier, we're going to get rid of spoke. So keep, keep in mind, 
in, in back in, in the early days like that, um, I was asked by the Premier with Nancy Hutton, who was with the Department of Health at that time, she was the public service lead, I was the lead for Premier Hand. How do you bring this together? So deputies disagree too, by the way, right? There's a subset here when you're looking at a corporate policy and goes looking, all of a sudden finance is involved, health is involved, and everybody's got an opinion. Municipal affairs is involved because they're policing the illegal sale of tobacco. Everybody's got an idea. Get everybody in a room. Get the best information you can and put it in front of the elected officials and help them make a decision. So they know the, the tobacco thing, as you all know, evolved over a period of time. But I'm in Quebec City about four years later, Deputy Health Promotion and Protection. And the tobacco industry, in their wisdom, issued these small cigarillos for women. You remember those colorful boxes, rum flavored, all that kind of stuff, aimed at women, young women. So my job was to convince the federal deputy with my provincial colleagues, you need to ban that. You need to ban that. That's another way of the tobacco industry. Deputy said no. So I go to the table where the ministers are meeting, and my minister, Barry Burnett, said, how'd you make out? Struck out. I said, damn. I said, I got an idea. I ran down to the lobby of the hotel. I bought a package of those cigarettes. And I showed it to Barry, sat back at the table. Barry says, go give it to the federal minister, who was Tony totally Clement. I go up to the front, lean over his deputy, who just said to me an hour ago, no friggin' way, and I hand it to Minister Clement. This is for Minister Burnett. A little word of a lot of comment is, are you kidding me? This is targeted at women. No shit, Sherlock. And away we went. You can impact public policy in a lot of interesting ways. And by the way, I work for a lot of ministers and a lot of and four premiers. I loved every one of them. I did. They're human beings, like we're human beings, and you're trying to figure what's the best, if, if their heart's in the right place, and, and I'm telling you, I didn't meet a premier that really didn't care about this problems. Then you've got to help them to provide advice that helps them achieve that. And the better advice you can give them, the more successful they can be. And the last thing I'll sort of say, I'm rambling on here. Public servants love to see their minister succeed. They love to see their minister succeed. Not because they're NDP or liberal or conservative, because they, that minister is their leader. And we want them to succeed. Sometimes our passion might get in the way, and we might not as objective as we should be, but they want to succeed. So. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Any lesson for all of us in taking those small acts of courage? <laughs> Calcul you know, calculated. But, uh, no, that's beautiful. Um, why don't you walk us through your, your, your third clip? Um, this, is, this is about, you know, the civil service, in, in essence, I think, was the, the YouTube upload. And it's, it's actually about the opposite, you know, end of a, a civil service career. Someone uh, looking at leaving the civil service and describing some reasons why. So, but you know, maybe set that up for us. I, I picked this one because um, I always tell my team that your role is to gain the trust of stakeholders. Your role is to get out there, roll up your sleeves, try to understand what the union folks, the construction folks, the university presidents. What are they really saying and develop a relationship with them? Because then when I'm going to brief the minister, you can tell me exactly what they're saying. By the way, I work hard at that too. It's called empowering your people. Take some risks, get out there, know those front end users, and, and, and learn a little bit about them. And this is a good clip about a civil servant who's totally frustrated. Civil service consists 
of circulating information in his realm. And I said that was attributed to Sir Humphrey, which was actually uh, the young the, the sort of student. So uh, you've been robbed uh, grievously. I apologize. We will, we will make amends. But uh, I mean, do, do you see that? Does that does that does that happen? Do you see like what do you do when you, you have employees that are really frustrated um, in the department and, and struggling to find a meaning in it all? And how do you control it? Be a good listener. Really try to understand what people are trying to articulate and why people are upset. Uh, not that you try to bend to solve their problem, but you try to understand their problem. Because uh, your job as a deputy is to articulate uh, to your leaders uh, what's going on. My favorite favorite thing I ever did was um, the tarp rods. And you'll remember Bruno Marcocchio and all the angst and all of the anger and all the whatever and freedom of hand and say, how do we how do we get out of this mess in the context of that community thing's not working? So I said, let me go meet with some people in the community. Framers said, great idea. Some of the political people didn't think it was a great idea. I said, no, no, we can set it up. I can meet with my daughter and stuff. Framers said, go do it. It's a beautiful summer day. I'm meeting with three citizens of Whitney Pier. And they looked at me and they said, Doc, we need to know a couple of things. We don't care. We don't care about all the noise and the community group. And the, the only thing we want to know are our children and our grandchildren safe. That's all we want to know. And we don't want you to tell us they're safe or bring your hand to tell us they're safe. We want science to tell us they're safe. And by the way, why don't you have an office here in Sydney for the tar cones? It's a huge project. You're all meeting in Halifax. So I go back to Framingham and Ms. Deputy and the chief of staff. We reached out to Alan Rock. He paid for like 50 scientists to go in there and do the testing, and he set up the tar cones. That group had me back for a barbecue in the back deck in the summer while all the scientists were drilling holes all around. <laughs> Take some rest. But there again, there's a, a, a premier and who wanted a, a solution. And they like risk takers who do risk in a wide way. And, and I've never been told by a premier uh, to be bent in a political way at all. Just go up there and tell me what you think and come back. Because they would say to me, my job is to make the final decision, not you. Uh, okay. I really want to join LAE now. <laughs> you seem like a good person to work with. So, Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, really thank you. Thank you. Okay, you've all been very patient. We have one last speaker, so uh, we're going to do this in about 45 seconds. So, everybody, welcome uh, Ann Tucker. Ann, welcome. So, Ann, uh, switch it a bit longer than 45 seconds, maybe. Um, you have degrees in Russian studies, urban planning. So you bring kind of a municipal affairs HRM voice to this discussion, uh, which is really good. And you know, you you've also worked in the Ontario Civil Service in, in the Ministry of Health and Human Ministries over there, right? And um, but the clips you chose for us today are more on the, the municipal side of things. So I wonder if you can kind of um, maybe tell us why you've chosen you know the clips you have and and uh, they come from this episode called Quality of Life. So and set, set, set up the first clip for us. Well, the episode is, there are two different concurrent themes in it really. Uh, one is a developer is trying to get some additional height for a building. <laughs> with that dynamic. Uh, he has a 38 story building, he wants six more stories. But the uh, Minister's Party Manifesto mm -hmm. has said they don't want any new buildings higher than eight stories. So we feel very well in Halifax. <laughs> but obviously some sort of uh, dynamic there. And the uh, developer suggests
Lucius Expressoris, uh, six of them. And we are making the formal application later, of course, to any guidance that you can give them. I think I ought to warn you that I have the greatest misgivings about these rectile blocks. You know. This is how we make our profits. Six extra stories, and we'll really clear up without them. We'll only make a measly 28% on the whole project. I see. It's just profits, is it? It's not just profits, it's profits. <laughs> Don't you know where you put money? No, why? <laughs> <laughs> the must be Set it up and uh, 
So I mentioned that there were two concurrent themes in this particular episode, and one is about the uh, building discussion. The other is the minister is on his endless quest for a good publicity. And so to get a big, splashy photo op, he goes to uh, City Farm in the inner city to get some great photos with cute kids and furry animals. The City Farm's uh, lease is coming up. It's due to expire, and they asked him in front of the cameras and the press, will you do everything you can to ensure that we're able to stay here and in case that he will. Uh, unbeknownst to him, Sir Humphrey has transferred that particular lot to Inland Revenue to become a parking lot. And I couldn't help but think of this in the context of converting green space to a parking lot. It wasn't actually um, intentional, but anyway, here we are. So this is obviously a media disaster for the minister, but Sir Humphrey has a plan. Oh, uh, Minister, I just happened to be passing. I've uh, had an idea. Mm -hmm. If you were to give us uh, permission for an extra nine stories, I'm going to ask you to sit. Oh, yes, but if you were to give us nine extra stories, uh, we could postpone phase three for seven years. That would leave this side vacant. Well, uh, well, I was reading this morning in the in the Financial Times about your visit to the city farm. I thought it was a jolly good wheeze. Then you see uh, our phase three site is only 200 yards from it, so you could use it extend the farm, or if they had to move, for any reason, it's actually a bit larger. We, we thought of calling it the James Hacker Cuddly Animal Sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, animal Sanctuary, anyway, and the nine stories really isn't very much, is it? James Hacker Animal Sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I just want to say the one thing I like about this episode is we don't actually as much of Sir Humphrey as we do in a lot of the other episodes. But that little scene of him at the end, they're standing in the background, smiling on him typically, it's kind of, I think, something a lot of civil servants can uh, identify with, that you haven't been prominent, you know, the whole show has been about the minister's interaction with people and the minister getting the media, and you've just smoothed the way for everyone to get what they want, and you will be very satisfied with that. Wow. So, and I think that's about all the time we have. Uh, I'd love to keep on talking, you know, for hours on this topic, but I recognize some of us have lives, not me. Um, on behalf of IPAC, the Institute of Public Administration of Canada, I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, thanks also to our event organizers, Hunter Gillis in the corner doing his MPA uh, degree. <laughs> Hunter does have a copy of Graham's book, so he's, uh, he's, he's well set up to succeed in his program uh, with Dr. Quigley. Um, and, and Riley Nielsen, who just had to go, and, and I put her stuff in the cabinet, so she had to kind of walk in front of me. Um, but I didn't tell her I put her stuff in the cabinet, that was the challenge. Um, uh, thank you also to our hosts, the Halifax Club, uh, and most of all, um, our speakers, uh, Graham, Simone, uh, Lorraine, Duff, uh, Anne and, and Kevin, um, I really appreciate you sharing these stories, these insights. Uh, there's some really, really good ones. <laughs> I'm going to remember your story for, for quite a while. Um, and, and I think there is uh, quite a, a legacy of this, of this show, and I think someone's going to be talking about it uh, when they hit <coughs> 50 um, in, uh, in 10 years. So uh, thank you again for your patience, uh, hanging around, sticking around to be made, and um, really appreciate it. All of you being here. Uh, so, see you again soon. Thank you very much.